Well, good afternoon Let's start. and welcome to Europe Debates. I'm Richard Milsom, the director of the European Conservatives and Reformist Party in Brussels. And thank you for joining me for our weekly and popular series of webinars. Today's debate addresses the question of, is Russia Europe's main threat? Whilst West, the Western world has been distracted by the coronavirus, Russia has quietly been reinforcing its position. Over the last few months, the Kremlin has become, inc uh, become increasingly bold in its use of misinformation in European member states and its redeployment of troops along its frontier, adding only to the already long list of Russian aggression around the world, from the invasion of Ukraine and Georgia to interference in elections in the Balkans to carrying out covert operations in the heart of the English countryside. Without a strong international response, Russia will continue to spread its influence across Europe and weaken democratic institutions. The European Conservatives and Reformists have long been at the forefront of the fight against Russian aggression. And in this online panel, we will address what needs to be done to tackle Russia as the main threat to Europe. This is a very broad topic and there's much to discuss. Uh, I would like to concentrate on five key areas, security and defense, continued democracy building in post-Soviet states, energy security, border security, and disinformation and propaganda. Now, this webinar is live streamed across multiple platforms, including YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. And we're very grateful for the hundreds of people that have registered and will be following this debate live. Please do use the comment section to ask questions, which I will relay to the panel. So let's get it started. Our panel to each give a five minute introductory sort of statement. Uh, we'll start with Mrs. Fottiger. Uh, Anna Fottiger, who is known to many of you as a Polish MEP, former Foreign Minister of Poland and Chair of the European Parliament Security and Defence Committee. Um, she served as the Vice President of ECR since 2014 and was recently selected by NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg as a special consult for NATO's political arm. So Anna, if you want to get us going, and perhaps I could just pose a, a general question, to what extent do you see Russia as the main threat in Europe? Over to you, Anna. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Richard, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. On uh, January 15th, uh, President of Russian Federation Vladimir Putin uh, uh, announced uh, the so-called uh, constitutional reform in, in Russia. A constitutional reform that was uh, voted in Verkhovna Rada for uh, in early March or mid March, uh, both reading, second and third uh, reading, and actual reform that that was uh, simply prolonging uh, or giving uh, Vladimir Putin uh, possibilities to stay in office uh, until eternity, lifelong, uh, so serving a lifelong tenure. We are not uh, sure he, he, he is going to, to serve like this. But anyway, this constitutional change was simply a, a very important uh, change of, of uh, rules. And we have to, to, to take this into account. All these actions were taken um, amidst uh, the very dire pandemic uh, hitting uh, Russian Federation severely. People uh, in, in Russia locked down and actually they, uh, they feel it very much. In every country it is uh, very difficult, but certainly in Russia in uh, particular, in all our uh, countries in Western uh, world, uh, we focus on, on helping uh, private uh, businesses, SMEs in particular, uh, to, to survive this difficult uh, period. In the Russian Federation, where this uh, private small-scale business is uh, just mere 20% of, of uh, economy, Nothing was done to, to, to support people. So dissatisfaction of, of uh, what did you put in rules, rule grows. Silently, as you told us, uh, Richard, there are moves uh, mm, uh, posing threat to, 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 to 
uh, neighborhood to to free world. Uh, uh, there are drills going on in, in Crimea and other territories. Uh, uh, Putin regime does not take into account uh, safety of, of uh, soldier, of troops, uh, and, and trying to show off uh, the, the, the possibility to, to launch effective uh, offensive uh, in any circumstances. That is extremely important. Also huge uh, disinformation as, and misinformation campaign uh, was launched uh, uh, because of coronavirus uh, and taking uh, advantage of, of emotions accompanying pandemics all over the world, uh, further uh, attacking uh, unity of, of NATO allies, uh, the, the possibility of, of unity of, of uh, other organizations of, of uh, uh, Western world, European Union, uh, other organizations. Um, we, we still face uh, um, combat actions taking place in eastern Ukraine supported by, by, uh, by uh, Russian Federation uh, and, and uh, still people perish uh, there. Also, there were aggressive moves in, in Georgia with uh, Farther borderization uh, move of CBRN troops to 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 occupy uh, territories of jo of Georgia. Actually, all these uh, moves show that even in very difficult situation with uh, um, uh, slumping uh, oil pri prices. Uh, uh, endangering revenues of the state, Russian Federation is is able and willing to 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 keep this aggressive posture. So, in my opinion, uh, Russia remains a very important uh, threat to 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 world security, not only to Europe's security. <clears throat> I see strange correlation uh, during coronavirus pandemics between uh, uh, propaganda campaigns uh, of Russia, China, and also to some extent Iran to, 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 to smaller, on um, smaller scale. But we have to take this uh, into account. I think that uh, um, these uh, campaigns are accompanied by, by, by special operations aimed at uh, um, uh, imposing chaos and, and, and uh, disrupting operations of Western uh, societies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Really great. So I'd now like to introduce to you Luke Coffey, who's the director of the Allison Center for Foreign Policy Studies at the Heritage Foundation in Washington, D.C., where he's been doing that since 2015, uh, overseeing policy and international affairs issues. He's, he's been actually at Heritage since 2012, previously with the Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom as a fellow focusing on relations between the U.S. and the U.K. and the role of NATO and the European Union in transatlantic Eurasian security. Before Heritage, uh, Luke served at the UK Ministry of Defence as a senior special advisor to the then British Defence Secretary Liam Fox. Uh, and as a veteran and a commissioned officer in the US Army, he was deployed for Af to Afghanistan for a year and was awarded the Bronze Star. Luke joins us from across the pond. A very, very good morning to you. Uh, and I wonder if I could kick you off with um, how can Europe work more constructively with the United States to counter the threat from Russia? Thanks, Richard, uh, for that very kind introduction. I need to have you around all the time to introduce me um, <laughs> for events like this. <laughs> and also, thank you very much to the uh, Euro European Conservatives and Reformist Party 
Um, you guys do great work. You guys are a great voice uh, for reform and conservative principles in Europe. And uh, it's an honor to be part of this uh, discussion today. Um, I will talk about, uh, in five minutes, I'll briefly um, sum up why, to answer the question of the title of this discussion, why Russia is the main threat for Europe. I'll discuss why this matters to Americans as the only American here on the panel. And then I will talk about um, perhaps some ways that the US and Europeans can work more closely together uh, on this issue. Firstly, Russia is without a doubt the most direct security and military threat that Europe faces today. If you live in Central and Eastern Europe, this threat is an existential threat in ways that many in Western Europe simply do not understand. Uh, Russia today is often described as, um, well, we often hear commentators say, well, this is Cold War Russia. This is how Russia behaved during the Soviet Union. Uh, when, we, when we discuss what Putin is doing, this is how it's often described. And I think this is a very lazy uh, approach to analyzing the situation. Today, we do not have a Soviet Russia. We do not have a Cold War. We actually have an imperial Russia. We have a 21st century Russia that with, uh, with 18th century ambition. And Putin is very much an imperial leader. And because of his constitutional gymnastics, he has been either prime minister or president since 1999, and he will stay in either one of these positions for the rest of his life. And if we know one thing about him, he's a very healthy person. At least that's how he comes across. So he's going to be around forever. So we are dealing with imperial Russia that, like during imperial times, tried to maximize Russian influence using all tools of the state, military, diplomatic, trade, economic. And now we have... Um, Perhaps they're not new, like issues like disinformation and energy security issues. These are not necessarily new, but because of advancements in technology from imperial times, these issue, issues are more important than ever before. So um, in terms of why this matters to the United States, um, you know, there was a big discussion, as I'm sure everyone knows, during the last presidential campaign in 2016. Uh, there's still some debate today about the importance of NATO and, and why Europe should matter or shouldn't matter for the United States. And I think there are two uh, main reasons why it matters, why stability and security in Europe matters to the United States. The first is the economic reason. And this, I think, probably resonates very well with the Trump administration. Half of the world's GDP almost uh, is made up from the North American and European continents we're each other's number one trading partners. We're each responsible for the creation of millions of jobs on either side of the Atlantic. We are each responsible for uh, billions, perhaps even you know trillions of dollars in foreign direct investments. And this creates jobs and this benefits the, the American um, consumer, this uh, benefits the American taxpayer and the American worker. Uh, without the stability and security that NATO has provided over the years, none of this would have been possible. So actually the U.S. gets a very great return on its very modest investment through NATO to ensure that Europe remains stable and secure. Uh, the second reason um, it matters is a more of a normative one, which I, I actually try staying away from normative uh, discussions and, and ideas because it's, it, you know, it can be um, very subjective, but, you know, America's oldest and closest allies are in Europe. Um, we share the same views and ideas about economic freedom, uh, independent judiciary, um, freedom of the press, basic freedoms. Uh, uh, we share, uh, well, many of the same ideas that we um, have today in the United States came from the earlier settlers from Europe to the United States. So we are bonded like this in, in many ways. So this is a factor as well. And then finally, and, and this is a very technical issue, uh, the U.S. is obligated by a treaty to defend Latvia in the same way it would defend Louisiana. And if we do not want to uh, live up to these obligations, then we need to have a serious discussion and serious soul searching to do. Uh, but until we have this, uh, until we change our minds and get out of this arrangement, this is uh, how it is. 
And actually, I think it benefits the United States that we are in an alliance like NATO. Now, in terms of what the Europeans and what NATO or what uh, Europeans and Americans can do uh, to help counter this threat, you know, there's a whole laundry list of things. But just uh, off the top of my head, I would say that Europeans need to make it very clear that NATO is and will remain the cornerstone of transatlantic security and transatlantic defense. Um, and that anything um, it, it, that the European Union um, will not have the right of first refusal, any military structures or institutions created within the European Union um, should come secondary to NATO. And we should ask ourselves, every time the European Union creates a new defense or military institution or structure or initiative, we should, the first question we should ask is, can this be done under NATO? That should be the first question. And I would like for both Europe and the Americans to go back to Madeleine Albright's 3Ds from 1999, no duplication of NATO structures, no discrimination of non-EU um, members that are in NATO, and no uh, decoupling of the United States of Europe security. The second thing I, I believe we need to do better is um, really understand what NATO is meant to do, what it's truly meant to deliver. And that is collective security, collective defense. And if you read the 1949 North Atlantic Treaty, Article 6, it says, in the North Atlantic area, north of the Tropic of Cancer. NATO doesn't have to be everywhere in the world doing everything, but it does have to be in this region able to defend and then finally, we need to um, have a better understanding about some of this uh, uh, finance and investment issues when it comes to defense. And we, we need to find better ways to get countries in Europe to spend more and make the case to their publics why spending on defense is important. And one proposal I've been floating around for years, but it's picked up no traction whatsoever, unfortunately, is that at a NATO ministerial meeting, or perhaps even better, at a NATO summit, have a special session uh, or a, a regular session for finance ministers. Because as an American who worked in a British uh, parliamentary system, coming from a presidential system we have in the United States, I understand the difference how in, in America, the legislative branch controls the appropriations authority and the authorizations authority and the funding. Whereas across most of Europe in the parliamentary system, the legislative branch has very little say on specific funding lines, uh, like the defense budget. It's, this power is consolidated in the government and mainly at the finance ministry level. So if the finance ministers had a better understanding on why defense is so expensive and why it costs so much, then perhaps they can have a better political debate around the cabinet table in their capital and amongst their publics back at home. Uh, so I'll stop there and I look forward to any questions and this discussion going ahead. Thank you. So thank you, Luke. Some very interesting uh, points that we can pick up on a little bit later there, but uh, thank you for joining us so early in the morning and uh, it's always good to hear from the cousins. So if I may now, I shall move across to Ambassador Batu Kutelia who's the former Georgian ambassador to the United States and currently vice president of the Atlantic Council of Georgia. He's had a long and distinguished career in building political progress, promoting democratic values and political professionalism in Georgia. And we're delighted to have him here today. Um, perhaps ambassador, I could start you off with what lessons we can take from the way that Russia has behaved towards Georgia. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, first of all, thank you for this great initiative and this debate. I think it's uh, very timely and uh, the problems that the world is facing because of the pandemics um, really is, uh, acts as a catalyzer of the long-awaited uh, changes in the geopolitics. Uh, economy might be paused, but Geopolitics is really moving in quite an accelerated way. And one of the characteristics of the new geopolitics, as how we see it from Georgia and in Europe, is that uh, problems and the threats that the democracy is facing is very similar, whether it's in Georgia, Ukraine, Poland, or any other place. And uh, it has a particular name. And this threat uh, declared themselves as a threat of democracy. That was Putin, who recently in the G20 summit clearly said that 
liberal democracy has been uh, gone and there needs to be a new model. And as, it, as Luke mentioned, uh, going back to be an imperialistic minded, they have ambition uh, of the redistributing the world again. So creating a new order. And this uh, order has been undermined by Russia. Uh, first visible signs were in 2008 when they invaded in Georgia. Uh, it took uh, roughly eight years for transatlantic community to admit that uh, Russia is no longer can be perceived as a partner. And uh, in uh, 2016, in the NATO Warsaw Summit, uh, the paradigm was shift and Russia was not labeled as a partner anymore, but it was the first time when Russia was labeled as a threat number one. So uh, that's why it's important to dismantle this bigger kind of a, a phrase of the Russian threat. What is uh, this threat consists of? And uh, I'm sure that's why I said there is a lot of similarities how all others in the democratic world see the Russian threat. So the first and the uh, most important uh, strategic goal, uh, as I said, Russia's uh, ambition is to question democracy, undermine the democracy. The second uh, important strategic goal for them is uh, uh, to deter the West, to persuade a proactive agenda or proactive policies, uh, to put it in a defensive mode, or in a reactive mode. Um, another strategically important goal for, is, uh, for Russia is to prevent US leadership and to crack the EU-US uh, relation, to uh, amplify the problems that exist across the Atlantic. Uh, another important strategic goal for uh, Russia is questioning or limiting sovereignty of its targets. And when I'm saying targets, I mean the targets of opportunity, because Russia behaves as a revisionist and opportunistic uh, power, and they see targets as an opportunity targets. Whether they will see opportunity, they will act. Uh, so that's why the questioning sovereignty increases their probability of uh, taking this opportunity and uh, persuade the ag aggressive uh, means of coercion. Another important goal they have is an erosion of the legitimacy of the rulers you know, within the democratic countries, uh, er eroding their legitimacy within the country or internationally through uh, undermining the democracy or their democratic credentials. Also important in that class for them is uh, undermining or subverting the state institutions. So while state institutions are weak, that means the country is less, uh, less resilient to this type of pressure. And important component, which Russia is uh, trying to mount a enormous pressure, is undermining also the national consensus within the nations on the key fundamental values. Some cases they are successful, in some cases less, but still it remains their primary goal. So to sum up of their strategic goal is that they want to create, if we use a military terminology in a political sense, to create a political anti-excess area denial for the West. So in some particular space that they see as their own space of influence. Uh, well, and means are the number. Uh, several of those have been mentioned. Is this a propaganda or economic energy dependence, fiscal dependence, Georgia faces a growing dependence on Russia slowly, unfortunately. And it's not only classical understanding of economic or fiscal or energy dependence, because with the economic relations with Russia comes corrupt practices. And this corruption is kind of a lubricant of their um, entire operation of state capturing, which is a quite uh, obvious means of achieving their political goals. In parallel, of course, classical, conventional, military coercion and the occupation of the Georgian sovereign territories, Crimea, Donbas, is a perfect uh, manifestation of it. It's being used as a psychological tool of pressure, while also some other components of the hybrid are in full uh, capacity deployed. And that is being supported with a classical means of subversion as well, the networks of uh, uh, influencers or useful idiots, uh, or, or spies, infiltration of the particular uh, agencies to affect political or economic decision of sovereign countries. And frankly, pandemic really amplified these problems and it became really visible because 
notwithstanding that they have their own problems a lot, still as an opportunistic power, they are trying to persuade what has been uh, uh, declared or uh, decided for them a strategic goal. So, in the end, I would like to conclude that, yeah, and of course, the uh, public polarizing the public, especially when the election years are looming, like in Georgia or in US or many other countries, that increases their chances to achieve their goal, to undermine the credibility of institutions or the democracy process through deploying a lot of trolls, misinformation. Uh, Facebook just recently canceled uh, only two uh, instances, up to 1,000 fake news pages, mostly linked uh, uh, with the government. And uh, basically what they were doing is anti-Western propaganda, anti-Americanism, even government-sponsored ones, and plus polarizing the society. So, and uh, at the end, what can be done? And as I said, if the problems are similar, then solutions must be similar. So the Europe and the uh, United States, in general, the democratic West, uh, really have to finish the unfinished job. And this unfinished job is persuading the idea of Europe, Poland, free end and peace. So uh, both, both Ukraine and Georgia, and the good news is that the Montenegro and Northern Macedonia just joined the NATO, but this needs to be prolonged. It needs to be declared as an important goal and step-by-step -step action plan. Ukraine deserves, Georgia deserves to become a NATO member country, notwithstanding a lot of our internal struggles, but that's part of the process. And uh, this case is not only because of Georgia and Ukraine. It's important for the new European security architecture, which Russia is questioning as a new imperialistic power, trying to declare it as kind of its sphere of influence. Um, and uh, economic uh, problems that have been amplified by the uh, uh, coronavirus and the pandemics really brings an important role for the European Union, more securitizing the economic relations, uh, giving a stress in the economy where investments will get a more screening, not only the European Union, with the partner countries as well, will get more national uh, security aspect type of vetting or screening, plus allowing the partner countries who are uh, um, acting as a good and strategic partners benefit with this new redistribution of the supply chain of the logistic network. This will amplify and increase the moral high ground as well for the European Union and United States to persuade more aggressively expansion of the uh, area of freedom, which is shrinking right now. And recent Freedom House report was a quite an alarming sign in, in this regard. So I would stop here and uh, look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Very, very, very good points. And, uh, you know, the, the ECR have been strong friends of Georgia since our formation. Uh, Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, you know, we know that you, you live with it on a day-to-day -day basis in South Ossetia and Espresso, and also the, you know, the trade implications and, and other problems as well. So we'll come back to some of that. But if I may now, I shall move to Spain and to Herman Turch, who is a good colleague, good friend, uh, a Spanish MEP from the Vox Party, a former newspaper and radio journalist who serves on the European Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, Herman, welcome. Uh, perhaps I can kick you off with, um, yeah, a criticism from the East is often that Western European countries don't take the threat from Russia seriously enough. What is the Spanish experience uh, in dealing with Russia? Well, that's absolutely true. Uh, thank you. First of all, Richard, thank you for this interesting, highly interesting debate. And I think very pertinent now in this moment. In Spain, we have this problem and we have this problem, which is naturally now no, more accurate and more, more difficult than ever, because we have a new situation. We have a new situation with a socialist left wing a government with communists inside, com communists who have a strong relation to Venezuela to Cuba and also to Iran and Russia. And this makes a, naturally the situation, it's a, it's a really awkward a situation we, we, are, we are facing now in Spain since four months. Now it's getting, it's becoming really tough with the, with the decisions that have been taken in, in, the, in, in all this current with the, with the coronavirus. But uh, seeing Russia, I mean, to, to, to explain that Russia is this, uh, is this danger is very difficult for a country which is so far away. And, uh, and where the 
anti-Americanism is so deep rooted. It's so not only in the left; it's deep rooted. It was also uh, deep rooted uh, in general because of the war with the United States uh, a hundred uh, century ago. I mean, in 1989, uh, uh, the loss of Cuba, and so on. We have this historical thrift with the uh, with the United States, which makes the anti-Americanism a very easy. A question to to move and to agitate. Uh, we had it under Franco, uh, and we have it we have it very strongly now. We have now, but you see it. I mean, we see it, it's 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 really a pity that we can see it even in in Jose Borrell when uh, Borrell speaks in, in as a high representative of the of the foreign affairs of the uh, of the European Union it's very difficult when he speaks about the United States that he doesn't that some some negative uh, comment or some negative word doesn't escape from his lips i mean it's almost it's almost impossible with with Borrell but it's also also impossible with our government who is a uh, normally in, in in almost insulting insulting trump and the president and insulting the states now we've lost we had we were on the career for some very important contracts with for the south of spain navantia uh, for some shipyards for uh, some some uh, ships for the navy uh, they were frigates i think it was six or seven frigates with a possibility of of amplifying it to to more for for ten or fifteen, a huge contract, and it was now lost because I mean the, all the negative expressions that this government and the last two years of the government, which was an, an uh, interim left wing government, has has been putting uh, have have brought this to a collapse. This contract, which was very, very important for Cadiz and for this region, which is a really poor region. Now, Spain is the the economy of Spain will collapse. In and we got yesterday the information from Brussels can't be worse. It's what the prospects are really, really terrifying, and so we'll see what happens with the general mood. But the, as I say, we we will have we have a very tense situation with a with a very a very dangerous a government. But speaking about Russia, a Russia has a itself it will have a an aftermath of coronavirus, which will be very very dangerous. They have an enormous difficult situation with their a, with their commodity with the commodity market and with the oil market, a, which they have, and they will they will have. Many many tensions. Uh, Twenty years after Putin arriving, I mean that this scarcely was really done deeply to to make this country a country which which uh, makes an added product, added value in in their in their production and in their in their economy. So I think they are going to have uh, problems, and with these problems, uh, the propensity. Of Russia to some adventures outside will grow as well, and to create tension in any case in 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 Europe. So I think it's uh, we are coming into a very tense situation. But the bipolarization with China from the United States or Western with China will grow, and we will have in in Europe we will have our our. Um, uh, Russia as the main, as as you well said, uh, uh, the main main danger, geostrategic danger in 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 the in the region. The mo the biggest danger for me is is the internal the internal disarray in in Europe. All this talk uh, in, in of the of this third way, uh, this talk about this neutrality kind of of uh, temptations that you always see in these uh, military initiatives uh, by France, by Germany, by uh, by many others, by many others as well. But all this uh, is for is for I think an enormous danger. And we we have uh, some some big uh, navy bases uh, and some some uh, bases of the United States and NATO bases, which are very important for the South and for the Mediterranean and so on. 
And so with the internal disarray in Spain, which will be highly, highly, uh, as I say, it would be very, very difficult. And, and they are trying really to impose a regime which has nothing to do with the European principles. And it is a scandal that in Brussels, nobody speaks about it. Everybody's speaking about Poland and Hungary, but nobody speaks about what is happening actually in Spain, which is enormously dangerous, where you have all these narco cartels that work with Venezuelan with the Venezuelan regime and with the Venezuelan armies have their very best friends now in the in the in the government in Spain. I mean, it's it's really an, uh, a very 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 dangerous uh, development what we are seeing in Spain. And this 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 array on defense is not a Spanish question; it's a question, as I say, it's a, a pan-European uh, disarray where many didn't want to pay, uh, haven't been paying what they should for decades, and now, thanks to Trump and only to Trump, we came to a little bit of a movement, but a, a movement which many of them really are proud not to honor. Uh, the promises they make every two years or every three years to to fulfill their to fulfill their commitments on on defense. In this sense, I think it's a really really needed and enormous political effort to show the threats we have. It's China, it's Russia, and we have to see also Northern Africa. For us, it's very important. We have the enormous danger as well. And the penetration, as I say, from the uh, from the Ibero-American cartels through the left-wing groups that are coming to Spain, into Spain, through this uh, government we have now. I don't know if the government will collapse or not with all the catastrophe that is showing up for us in Spain. It will be difficult for a government really to, to uh, support, to see how they manage to go free, through the negative effects of this terrible pandemia, the effects of this uh, pandemia in Spain, which has been uh, really awful, uh, and and you can't uh, have they are not to compare with other with other countries. The economic uh, effects will be also uh, also far far worse than in in other countries in Europe. So we'll see what happens to the government. But as I say, seeing the danger in the in the internal disarray in Europe, I think Spain is one of the worst examples of how things can develop in Europe with an anti-American, left-wing, and totalitarian, and sympathetic to Chinese, and sympathetic to everybody who is anti-Western. He could, can be Islamic, he can be a narco-trafficant, or it can be communist, but uh, or everything what is uh, in, in which is in a position, let's say, anti-imperialist, as they, as they say, which is anti-American and anti-Western. Uh, uh, they have an alliance in this kind of movement that is uh, strong and has and has normally is being well treated by the mainstream in Europe disgracefully. And I would finish there. Great, super. Thank, thank you, Herman. Uh, the rise of the radical left is an ever-present danger. And actually, you know, we defeated in the UK, but we see those radical leftist governments in Spain and Italy have made an absolute hash of the coronavirus. And the impact... It can of that do such a harm in such a short time, which is incredible. incredible. Of course, the answer, the answer is parties like your own, Vox, which are storming ahead in the polls and doing extremely yeah. well, Fratelli d'Italia in, in Italy as well. Um, and, uh, you know, we need a change of government in these countries and we need uh, sound, sensible people like yourselves uh, going into government. So thank you. Anyway, um, yeah. right, let's uh, race ahead. Um, and last but not least, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Robert Zeller, a Latvian economist and politician, member of the European Parliament for the National Alliance, which is a free market national conservative party in Latvia. Uh, he's a busy man. He sits on the uh, European Conservatives Group, which, of which he's a vice chairman. And he's currently uh, a member of the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee, the Transport and Tourism Committee, and the Delegation for Relations with China. Uh, Roberts, thank you very, very much for, for, for joining us. And perhaps you could tell us what Russia has recently been doing in the Baltics. 
Uh, yeah, thank you, Richard, uh, for this uh, event and also uh, for introduction rewards. <clears throat> uh, well, Russia is doing, uh, ex I would say, the same as always. As we have a great experience uh, you know, in practice, of course, with Russia. <laughs> Being geographically there, we are uh, not only Latvia, but I would say also Estonia and Lithuania, all three Baltic states where very many things are in common in our history and also nowadays. Uh, with the one exception that uh, Latvians just recently celebrated the election of the Constitutional Assembly 100 years, and uh, we had the oldest constitution um, in, in, the, in Europe uh, since 1922, uh, and the uh, Assembly was just elected. Uh, just a few days ago, celebrated 100 years. And on the basis of the Constitution, actually, we created a uh, well, legal status of when we renew our state, uh, de facto, in uh, 1991. We kept all the citizenship rights uh, on the UN, uh, which was very important on the basis of the previous state, which we, of which we lost in 1940, uh, when Russia came in before Germans uh, Nazis uh, in the Second World War. Uh, so, and, and this is very important taking account that we have a significant amount of uh, people who arrived after Second World War who are communicating still in Russia and living in a Russian media environment. So, and uh, particularly in nowadays where it's, uh, you, you see the same as um, Russian world issues uh, and, and if you have uh, many in, uh, in inhabitants in Latvia, uh, citizens even, not uh, only non-citizens, which we have, so whom we, whom we have pretty many, uh, I would say about 25% of, of our population is still living in a Russian environment, uh, information. And you can imagine what's going on. For example, uh, about months ago, in the recently in pandemic, uh, when started uh, Europe Health, also in our country, which we managed uh, uh, from the health point of view very well, I think, in Latvia. But there was a, in, some kind of messages coming from this media, from the internet sources, that look, it's a failed state, uh, and then Seoul will ask to join again Russia because they, they Europe is not helping, which was partly, of course, true, not in case of us, but in case of Spain and Italy, which needed uh, really uh, the, the first, uh, really, really solidarity and really internal trade with, uh, with uh, health equipment, uh, which was necessary. And that was a disaster for Europe, and it was, of course, played by, by Russia. Last, last week, I would say it's a different a bit, because uh, particularly in Moscow areas, they have enough problems. And as you know, Putin's uh, social uh, support, uh, well, public support, fell down to 59%, which is still very high. And I think we, we don't uh, need to estimate that uh, opposition, a serious opposition, which could replace on certain stage somewhere in future, uh, I don't know after how many years, uh, Mr. Putin, they, they already have the same uh, empire um, uh, political sense. That means well, whoever will, will come to his uh, replacement, uh, well, after years, uh, there would be no big changes uh, from the security point of view for uh, Baltic states, for example, or Georgia or Ukraine. Uh, maybe there would be some something, some modifications, but nothing very uh, strategically different. So, and uh, coming for security, this point of view, for that's why for the Baltic states it was very important NATO. And if you would ask our citizens, uh, Latvian citizens, which institutions will create more security is, well, a feeling either NATO or you of definitely be NATO. That's why majority of people don't really trust that the European Union defense uh, development would create some kind of security for our area. That's why it's uh, what Luke said, uh, that the uh, United States will defend Latvia the same like Louisiana. It was very, very right in place. I think in many hearts, in, in my citizens who really understand this is important message. Uh, and um, that's, that's why I think we, we, we developed our democracy on a base of um, the euro, which means we had a significant non-citizens population still. It's that I, can, I think most of you know why it's so, because there are some uh, Kremlin motives to not to take a Latvian passport even so for, so for, for those who are living here and are, and are, are able to, to get this passport. There are some inconvenience to, to become a Latvian citizen or Estonian citizen, for example. So, but, uh, well, I, I would say that the why, where we are vulnerable, or used to be vulnerable, it's, of course, energy sector, particularly gas sector, which is uh, some development uh, already, it's done, and there is uh, really some market issues uh, between an, in the Baltic state gas market and Finnish market, so it's connected. Soon we'll be connected with Poland, the Lithuanians, and we will be our more safe uh, position. We have LNG terminal in Lithuania, and so, uh, things are going uh, in the best uh, in the best direction, 
the second threat was always in our politics. It's um, uh, well, it, uh, it's a corruption, of course. The state capture, like uh, like Ambassador already said, it's it's everywhere. One one of our, we used to have a serious oligarchs in power, but recently we increased significantly for political parties' budget uh, subsidies. And I think uh, even if we have a difficult coalitions, also my party. It's become better because the political parties uh, ruling the uh, country are not so much dependent from the gray or even black money sometimes from uh, related with Russia. We used to have the scandals in the Baltic states, you know, with the banking sector, with the so-called uh, non-residents, uh, well, uh, transactions, uh, and this was really the, the trouble for us. But I think things are, are getting better in this field. And um, I, I've also, about the global challenges what we experience now from the Russian side. I think well, what is what don't, what I really don't like, and it's partly touched also by Ambassador, that uh, some European leaders, particularly, uh, I would say, uh, that's not just a secret French uh, president who some time ago that he gave some interviews in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a in media, and he, see, he, should, he sees that Russia could be the partner of you in a global your political games uh, against uh, you against US or China as to see the partnership of with Russia so which is really worried uh, I think uh, many uh, politicians in, in, in particularly in my area in Central Eastern Europe also I am uh, sure in, in, in Poland uh, and I think we have to take in account that this is this, this, uh, this message is uh, create opportunities for Kremlin uh, to play with us in games. And the final point for introductory, what Luke said about the finance minister, ministers in, uh, how to say, introduction more in the NATO thinking. So I think it's very important. I, I was in the late 90s minister of finance in my country. And we were just on our starting to negotiate, uh, not um, really not negotiate, but to say diplomatic directions that we would like became a members of NATO and European Union. And I remember my also feeling before the first official visits to the United States and also with the Prime Minister, who, who was my party uh, member as well, that um, we received this strong signals that we have to increase capacity for the defense. And for Finance Minister, it was a very, very serious message, and you have to understand this is your responsibility as a Finance Minister to shift uh, geopolitical resources and to understand that it is uh, in the long run, even if it's not perhaps in your time to be Minister of Finance, you will see results, but it's in the long run, very important strategic decision. And it's, I think it's very good proposal, perhaps we have to keep in mind and also to do it in a foreign affairs debate and in a financial debate. So thank you. Superb. Thank you very much, Robert. Now, time is racing ahead. So um, let's try and get through a few more questions. Could, could I turn to the ambassador? Um, I think we should probably mention that Georgia seems to be doing a fantastic job on uh, coronavirus with only six deaths. Um, so, uh, so you seem to have really grasped the mantle there and, uh, and uh, uh, doing a good job. Um, I've got a question from Tom Myers in the UK. You have argued that Russia is trying to undermine institutions and its neighbours and elsewhere, and that Georgia is under state capture and under the current government is moving closer to Russia and Putin. But neither the US State Department, nor the EU, nor NATO seem to agree. How does this square with your viewpoint? Uh, well, just to be very blunt, uh, uh, there have been uh, uh, serious problems of backsliding in terms of the democratic institution governance in Georgia, and especially particular uh, phrase has been used. That's an informal governance that uh, bypasses the institution, and that uh, makes country really uh, not quite uh, uh, resilient to the external pressure. When you have an informal governance, notwithstanding some other democracy problems. And that's been indicated by the Freedom House. Uh, there have been a lot of warning, especially on the justice system uh, and the freedom of media or uh, political uh, coercion of the political opponents. And uh, last year, uh, Secretary Summer, last year, Secretary Pompeo, where it uh, openly in a public statement when he met with the Georgian Prime Minister, uh, listed the several major problems that the Georgian government should be looking at, and that was a democracy, uh, elections, fair elections, uh, the judiciary, the huge problems with the judiciary, uh, freedom of media, and also he uh, indicated a particular uh, problem of Georgia uh, 
reorienting its economic integration vector uh, towards the freer economies, uh, not to become prey of the Russian and Chinese uh, uh, aggressive uh, policies. And that's exactly, or almost exactly, the word the Secretary Pompeo used. And then he identified one particular problem of the deep sea port Anaclia, which Georgian government really badly handled. And nowadays, when we see the uh, redistribution or rearrangement of the supply chains on the European and Asian uh, uh, trade routes, it, uh, it proves that uh, Georgia could have been benefiting a lot having this project intact. So yes, there are warnings and the uh, US uh, partners openly or uh, not so openly are criticizing the Georgian credentials. That's our internal problems. Georgian opposition is uh, uh, doing uh, uh, a lot of activities, but uh, one of the fears with the handling well coronavirus, because right now we have a curfew and a lockdown, um, the informal non-institutional governance of the country really stimulates the uh, temptation from the government really to abuse this uh, excess amount of power in their hands. So that's been a debate in Georgia. But uh, I am very optimistic about Georgia's democratic future because we have a very vibrant civil society, we have a, uh, strong partners, but that does not mean that the Georgian democracy is really doing well. And unfortunately, the uh, degrading Georgia and the Freedom House democracy uh, ratings was one of the indicators. Though there are a lot of good achievements that Georgia has in terms of the deregulating, uh, fighting corruption, uh, police reform. That's been started during the previous government and some of those continue even uh, now and we are still benefiting out of it. In the easy doing business rating, Georgia is quite high. But again, that's the problem. And that's why I identified the Russian uh, infiltration or increased dependence on the Russian economy that opens a back door like uh, for, for a computer virus to mm -hmm. enter our system and then uh, subvert internally because with the Russian economy comes uh, corrupt business practices and the corruption is really a lubricant for the uh, Russian state capture. And with an informal governance, which is uh, quite well known fact, we have a one millionaire guy who really runs this country, uh, the dangers or resilience of Georgia towards these uh, threats are very low. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now I'm running short of time, so I'm going to start race around everybody again. I know Roberts has to leave at, uh, uh, at, at five o'clock. So um, could I just um, take you on a little bit further on the impact of the energy uh, dependence? Um, uh, uh, that um, that is so important for for, for your region, um, with the price of oil tumbling, um, with Gazprom supremacy potentially threatened in the future, uh, what 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 do you see as the impact of the energy dependence, uh, and what do you see coming in the future for Roberts? Well, as I talked very briefly uh, in my introduction, words, it uh, seems when uh, there's a gas market in Baltic states have improved, and, and I think it's it's better. Because, uh, well, just recently, Gazprom uh, was obliged to sell the shares in an in a, in a, in a, in a enterprise which was an infrastructure enterprise, in, including gas storage in Latvia. Uh, they, they, they did it uh, too late a bit. Uh, it was a couple of years later than it was required by EU legislation and by Latvian legislation, but they finally did it. And uh, because of this, uh, uh, how the demand of the gas dropped significantly, and uh, there was started some market prices uh, playing a role because of the LNG terminal in Lithuania, and also Finnish are coming to Baltic state market and buying gas, which is cheaper than uh, direct supplies from Russia. So it's, things are changing. But of course, the uh, majority of gas uh, are coming uh, mainly from uh, Russia. There is a three C's initial investment initiative. You may know the American uh, well, initiative, and also that joined by formally by you and Germany, uh, and also by, by Central Eastern European uh, governments. Uh, all, almost all of them, I think, totally, it's twelve uh, countries are interested in this. And there is creation of fund, and this fund would be uh, used for the increase uh, and uh, refurbish of infrastructure in the uh, energy sector and the transport sector. I think it's very useful initiative which will give our, 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 for us more market oriented things. But uh, what worry us, of course, the Nord Stream 2 <laughs> development, which uh, and even if there is a summer, 
some agreement between Russia and Ukraine for starting from the 1st of January this year, but I think it's, uh, in the long run it's not in the interest of Ukraine and it will cause some troubles. Uh, but uh, we worry that because, because of the German influence, uh, they are more and more depending from the Russian gas and it's of course we'll, we will feel in a foreign poli politics, uh, it's definitely in the future. And this is a dangerous thing. So that's, we have a, some good development in energy sector and some very worrying because uh, I think still uh, energy sector, particularly gas, will be the main arm of, of Russia also to influence political decisions. Thank you very much. So I really have to... No, I understand. And thank you. Other conference. <laughs> now, um, I think we can go a few minutes over. We've still got a very healthy audience watching us uh, online. So perhaps I could pose a kind of two-prong question to Anna and to Luke. Um, walking around the European Parliament, not, not recently, but uh, uh, anti-Americanism is tangible in that place. Um, it might be the death of TTIP, it might be Trump, it might be NATO, it may be a, a number of things. But, you know, this is very strange for us as the true conservatives in Brussels, who are strongly pro-transatlantic, strongly pro-NATO. Um, of course, the other thing is that, um, you know, uh, Eastern Europe <coughs> is probably the most uh, pro-transatlantic of, of, of the EU states. You know, what... Um, there's two questions here. What can we do to counter the spread of Russia? But also, what messages should be given to Congress in regards to increasing US support to Eastern Europe? So perhaps, Anna, do you want to have a crack at that? Yeah. No thank, thank you, Richard. Yeah. Uh, uh, allow me to start with uh, Batu Kutelia's, Ambassador Batu Kutelia's uh, remark that uh, Russia is uh, extremely, Russian Federation is... Uh, extremely opportunistic country uh, in its uh, actions and, and uh, uh, narratives. Uh, one narrative though is uh, extremely stable, permanent and, and uh, uh, present uh, for, for many years actually since uh, Cold, Cold War. It is uh, trying to, to dismantle the transatlantic bond. So strong, uh, strong cooperation between uh, uh, European states and, and uh, uh, American democracies, US in particular, and, and Canada naturally as well. Uh, you are right that my region, Central and Eastern Europe is, is probably the most transatlantic, that is why we are in the same uh, on continental Europe, because uh, surely traditionally UK is, is uh, extremely important, if not uh, the most important ally uh, uh, in Europe to the United States. Surely that is security issue. Uh, Europe is, is not able to, to defend itself. Uh, uh, against major threats, being it Russia, being it other uh, aggressive uh, attempts without strong presence of, of, of uh, US. Contrary to, 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 to propaganda, Russian propaganda, uh, propaganda or, or, or um, narratives present, for example, within European Parliament, uh, uh, the American uh, engagement in Europe increased recently. We have U.S. is uh, uh, the framework state in Europe in, in NATO forward presence uh, alongside other, other allies that are present in Poland and, and elsewhere. U.S. is... Uh, leading force to, to, to defend uh, uh, still Europe, to show uh, unity and, and to, to, to form uh, deterrence vis-a-vis -vis Russian aggression. Similarly, in actions, uh, in, in projects, actions in Ukraine and, and Georgia. It is under auspices of US uh, that 
all allies, even those who, who are named as, let's say, uh, uh, Russia friendly, uh, are engaged in exercises, in drills, preparing Ukraine to, 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 to strengthen the country against uh, Russia's uh, aggression. Uh, so there, there is a reassurance initiative. Uh, there is daily, daily presence also uh, recently in terms of, of building bond uh, within the region, uh, like, like uh, um, uh, Intermare uh, project that is still going, going on with participation of nine states. And, and even I would say that uh, uh, countries like Germany are, are, are uh, uh, quite interested in, in the project. Um, I think that we have much to, to, to do in terms of keeping our uh, partners, uh, Eastern partners like Georgia, Ukraine, but, but others step by step. I hope that also countries like Moldova. In, I'm absolutely sure that it should be other countries of, of uh, Eastern partnership like Azerbaijan that is important with all, uh, I would say, reservations that some, uh, some allies or some uh, EU members have vis-a-vis -vis this country. We have to, to, to bring uh, uh, the country closer and closer to, to, to European, to, to our, our uh, sphere of, 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 of interests. Uh, uh, Azerbaijan is a country uh, participating in our joint efforts to, to combat terrorism. It is. Uh, very moderate in terms of, of, of uh, uh, Islam. And we have to take these things uh, into account uh, as well. I hope because of, of, of long-standing interest that also Belarus becomes uh, uh, democratic one day. It is extremely difficult from our Polish point of view very difficult as they can, as uh, uh, it is our neighboring country with huge uh, uh, community of, of uh, people of Polish descent, but, but also Belarusians that are very close uh, to, to, to us and yet are under huge pressure from Moscow and, and from uh, from from also kind of of uh, uh, pressure from from the market from military side, we would like to have it closer. Unfortunately, impossible to do this under Lukashenko regime. Yeah, that's Thank very you. very true. Um, Look, do you want to do the other side of that? What more can America do? But what too on the other side can 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 Europe do to help? Well, the, the thing I would like the most would be for both sides to like cool down on some of the more extreme rhetoric. Uh, when you have senior European officials saying that the United States, the top three threats to the European Union are the United States, ISIS, and Russia, and this doesn't help things, you know, this is crazy talk, right? But, you know, it can equally be said that many of the tweets coming out of the White House are pretty crazy too. Uh, so I think we need to look beyond the tweets, right? Because I can tell you, if you are a, a Ukrainian soldier with a Javelin missile, and you have a choice between uh, a Javelin missile or a strongly worded tweet from the president, you're going to pick the Javelin missile, right? So we need to look beyond the rhetoric, I think. And if you look at what's happening on the ground, this administration has actually been very good with Europe, very good to NATO and spending more on European deterrence initiative than the previous administration. There are more U.S. troops on European soil than the previous administration. There's more training exercises than the previous administration. Uh, even uh, Secretary Pompeo at the Munich Security Conference announced one billion U.S. dollars in matching funds for the Three Seas Initiative Investment Fund. Uh, so I think that from, uh, from you know, taking the, the 
high level politics out of it. When you look at what's happening below the surface, uh, what's happening from day to day, uh, this administration has been strongly committed to the defense and security of Europe. Just before I came on here, I was involved with an, another virtual event with uh, General Cavoli, who's the commander of uh, US uh, Army in Europe. And it was very interesting listening to him, what he had to say about what the US is doing every single day to maintain readiness and to continue to train to fulfill its mission and obligations, even during this time of COVID. So uh, America is fully committed, and I think you know most Europeans understand this. But I think uh, it's uh, you know when you get to the higher upper echelons, when you get to the uh, the Brussels elites, uh, you know their their rhetoric um, is can be very unhelpful to that relationship. Yeah, that's very true. That's very true. Um, so thank you, Herman. Herman, um, you spent a large number of years covering the Cold War in Eastern Europe. Um, do you see comparisons by the way that Russia is acting then and how Russia is acting now? Yeah, well, there are some some patterns of behavior which are the which are the same. They are, they are imperial. They were imperial. They are imperial. They are imperial now. The thing is, uh, there was there was a, a far more compact Western part, even in the in the biggest crisis. Um, the biggest crisis you can you can call them maybe the Berlin Wall sixty one and uh, and uh, the the Doppelbeschluss what you call the double decision of the NATO um, with the with the Pershings and the cruise missiles uh, when there was in Germany really this uh, kind of resistance and uh, thanks to Helmut Schmidt and thanks to really the solidi solidity of then social democrats i mean which was a what's really an historical achievement of of helmut schmidt um, to bring this through uh, we had a, then uh, all this uh, this uh, things that were happening in a chain of a chain of of events that brought us so far after this 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 double Double decision, and and and, and you had the, then you had a, a, the Pope coming up, and then you had Reagan there with the SDI, and you had Thatcher, and you had the you had the strikes in Dansk in eighty, and then and everything started to move, and so so this all brought what it brought, but it came after there was this this position, this firm position to rearm. And to rearm was the the, the effect, the, the psychological effect of rearming of Europe was the the triumph of the of the NATO. The absolute triumph of the NATO was had the, the roots in this in this double in this double decision. I think that's clear. Now we we lack this. Uh, I, I think I'm 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 happy to hear uh, this the, that we have. Uh, Beyond this, this uh, rhetoric, this anti-American rhetoric, that the things uh, really are among armies and among uh, the teams are working well, and that the Americans are present as as ever or, or more than ever in in Europe because we 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 highly need them. We but but we need the perception. I think Obama's time was a disaster. I think the reaction to Syria to the to the to the chemical weapons then and so on, what the reaction to this uh, brought us to Crimea directly. Um, I think the catastrophe was uh, in, 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 a, in a whole extent, it was, it was provoked by this weakness uh, of, the, of the West and the weakness of the West was Obama itself, uh, himself, himself. Uh, with naturally, you can you can see many many culprits as well, probably in Europe. But there was the main actor. The main actor on the wrong decision uh, was uh, was Obama, as Obama was the one with this fate uh, for uh, this uh, this speech in 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 Egypt in El Cairo, which had also so dreadful consequences in many in many ways. Um, I think we have a, we had a very very bad time, 
and we need uh, we need uh, to recover from from that and we we need to bring a little bit of sense to europe europe is really senseless in the agitation i mean the whole anti-american agitation from the official side from the governments i mean what you hear of the mainstream in germany it's dreadful, but it's not the mainstream in the papers. It's the mainstream in the parties. I mean, in the serious parties which are governing the the Lenda and the and the and Berlin. and in in other countries, it's it's almost the same. This kind of progressive kind of um, of sentimental uh, weakness in in the in the thought pensamiento débil, you say in Spanish. No, it's um, it's it's a it's a it has consequences and it has serious consequences for um, mainly because all the the machinery of of the narrative is in this hands is in the mainstream hands is in this left wing uh, and in Spain it's incredible there's no not one one TV station which you can say has a minimum a, a centrist way of explaining the world or the things it's all left towards far left no mm -hmm. i mean and that is a uh, and, and but but uh, it was it was done and, and who who is a uh, who is to blame but also the 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 conservative parties which uh, which conceded and conceded that the culture and the rhetoric and the education uh, was in a uh, was left to the left-wing hands and it has been since 68, since 68 practically, it has been in leftist hands in Western Europe. And the consequences are this, which we are suffering now, that you really can't have a real debate in, on, on many issues. It's impossible to debate because we have dogmas of the left which are incontestable by now. It's and, that is, and that is, that is that's, that's terrible. Yeah. I know it's very dangerous and it very. Makes, hard, thank, thank you, Herman. Thank you, Herman. I'm afraid we we've, 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 we've run, happened, run. It, it happened to the states. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. Um, I'm afraid we've run out of time, and um, this is such a broad topic. There is so much we could talk about for hours and hours, but I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it for now. Um, I would like to extend a uh, a, a huge uh, um, uh, thank you to all of our panel members for joining us today been a very interesting debate um, like I say we need another four hours um, but sadly we haven't got it thank you also to the many people that have been watching us online um, do join us again next week uh, on Thursday the 14th of May at four o'clock Central European time for the next webinar entitled the future of NATO details can be found at the online uh, on the uh, uh, on social media and on our <laughs> website um, and thank you once again and I wish you all a very pleasant afternoon Stay safe, and I hope to see you here next week. Thank you. Thank you.